Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and uh, welcome to lecture number 21 of this lecture series on uh, turbo machinery aerodynamics. We have been discussing about turbines and in particular axial flow turbines in the last few lectures and we have had a chance to discuss about quite a few things about axial turbines. We started off with the very basics of uh, turbines in general uh, which is basically to do with the thermodynamics of turbines. And after having a very detailed discussion on the thermodynamics of flow through turbines, we have also discussed about the types of turbines. And we have seen that there are basically three types of uh, turbines possible. One is the axial flow turbine, the radial flow and the mixed flow turbines. And we have been talking about the axial flow turbines in the last uh, couple of lectures. And uh, in the last class, we have discussed about the fact that there are basically two configurations of axial turbines which are possible. Uh, one is the impulse turbine and the other is the reaction turbine. And uh, when I discussed about these two different types of turbines, I happened to mention that the reason why there are the, these distinct classes of turbines is the fact that the way stagnation or enthalpy drop takes place in a turbine is different in these two different types of turbines. Now, in a turbine stage, we know that um, turbine stage basically consists of a stator or a nozzle followed by a rotor. There is certain amount of pressure drop taking place in the nozzle and there could be certain amount of pressure drop taking place in the rotor as well. But there are certain types of turbines where the entire pressure drop or the enthalpy drop takes place only in the nozzle and uh, the flow simply uh, undergoes a turn as it passes through the rotor. So, these types of turbines are called impulse turbines and there are also types of turbines where the pressure drop or enthalpy drop is split or shared by both the nozzle as well as the rotor and these are known as reaction turbines. So, these are the two different or distinct types of turbines which we had talked about. In today's class, when we begin with we will basically be talking about a parameter which can be used as a parameter to distinguish between these two types of turbines. So, that is one of the main things that we are going to discuss about. We will start the lecture with discussion on what is known as degree of reaction. After that, we will be talking about the losses encountered in turbine, what are the different forms of losses and subsequently, we will also be talking about the efficiency or different forms of efficiency in a turbine. Now, when we talk about losses, uh, there are well, we have already had a very detailed discussion on well 2 D as well as 3 D losses in the context of axial compressors. It is the exact same concept which can be also used in a turbine. Therefore, I will not really go into the details of the different types of losses and how it can be estimated and so on, because we have already talked about that in the case of compressors. We can simply extend that to turbines. And so, I would rather not repeat the same thing here, but I will of course, go through the essentials of losses in a turbine and also how it can be estimated in a very generic sense and without going into too much of details, because they have already been covered in compressors. And then we will talk about efficiency and what are the different types of efficiencies. In fact, in turbines you can have different forms of efficiency. Uh, there are at least four or more different types of efficiencies that can be defined for a turbine, but we will restrict our discussion to two forms of efficiencies which are more commonly used. One is known as the total to static efficiency and the other is known as the total to total efficiency. There are also static to static and there are other types of efficiency which are not really used commonly and so we will not discuss those in a great detail. So, let us start our discussion with degree of reaction and what we mean by degree of reaction and how it can be used in a turbine. 
Now, uh, degree of reaction as you have seen in the case of compressors is uh, a concept which is used to kind of understand how much amount of um, work sharing is done by the rotor as a comparison of the entire work done in a stage. And so, in the, in the context of a turbine, here uh, the flow basically undergoes acceleration as you already know by now that it is an accelerating flow in a turbine and acceleration takes place both in the nozzle as well as in the rotor and therefore, as a consequence of that there is an enthalpy drop taking place both in the rotor well in the nozzle as well as the rotor. Degree of reaction gives us some idea about well uh, it, it is basically an indicator of the amount of enthalpy drop that is taking place in the rotor or in the rotor as a com as compared to the uh, enthalpy drop taking place across the entire stage. So, that is the basic significance of degree of reaction. So, but before we go into details of degree of reaction let us take a look at the uh, a typical velocity triangle uh, which I had discussed in detail in the last class. Let me quickly recap what this velocity triangle means. This is a typical uh, stage of an axial turbine which consists of a nozzle and a rotor. So, flow enters the nozzle at an absolute velocity of c 1 which is at an angle of alpha 1 leaves the nozzle at velocity of c 2 which is the absolute velocity and making an angle of alpha 2 with the axial direction v 2 is the relative velocity which makes an angle of beta 2 with the um, axial direction. And then flow from this enters into the rotor and leaves the rotor with the relative velocity of v 3 making an angle of beta 3 with the axial direction and c 3 which is the absolute velocity makes an angle of alpha 3 with the axial direction. The blade speed in both at the inlet as well as the exit of the rotor is assumed to be the same and equal to u. So, this is a very typical or a generic velocity triangle applicable to any axial flow turbine and so our definition of degree of reaction is with reference to since it is with reference to a very generic axial turbine it can be used in whether in the case of uh, impulse turbines as well as for reaction turbines and what we will see very soon is that uh, impulse turbine is a special case of a zero degree of reaction turbine that is when the degree of reaction is zero then that turbine refers is basically an impulse turbine. So, as I had mentioned earlier degree of reaction is defined as static enthalpy drop in the rotor divided by stagnation enthalpy drop in the stage. So, if you look at the rotor these are station it is between station 2 and 3. So, static enthalpy drop is h 2 minus h 3 divided by h 0 1 minus h 0 3 that is for the stage. Well, of course, we can always say that h 0 1 is also equal to h 0 2 because in the stator there is no enthalpy change stagnation enthalpy change. Now, so if you if you look at a coordinate system which is fixed on the rotor or in the relative frame of reference the apparent stagnation enthalpy is basically a constant and um, so we have uh, h 2 minus h 3 is equal to v 3 square by 2 minus v 2 square by 2. So, if the axial velocity is assumed to be the same upstream and downstream of the rotor then this can be reduced to h 2 minus h 3 which is stagnation uh, static enthalpy drop in the rotor is one half of uh, v w 3 square minus v w 2 square which is half of v w 3 minus v w 2 multiplied by v w 3 plus v w 2. We also know that the stagnation enthalpy change across a stage which is given by h 0 1 minus h 0 3 is basically a function of the blade speed and the change in the tangential component of the absolute velocity that is u times delta c w is basically the stagnation enthalpy drop. Therefore, h 0 1 minus h 0 3 is also equal to u times c w 2 minus c w 3. So, let us simplify the degree of reaction here. So, degree of reaction would become v w 3 minus v w 2 multiplied by 
Vw3 plus Vw2 divided by 2u into Cw2 minus Cw3. Now, if you go back to the velocity triangle, let us go back to the velocity triangle here. If you look at the components or the difference between Cw3 and Cw2, that is basically equal to the difference between Vw2 and Vw3, that is in their tangential direction. Therefore, Vw3 minus Vw2 is basically Cw3 minus Cw2 and so this degree of reaction will basically reduce to minus Vw3 plus Vw2 divided by 2u. Now, from the velocity triangle, you can also see that Vw3, which is the tangential component of relative velocity at the exit of the rotor is C a times tan beta 3. Similarly, Vw2 is C a tan alpha 2 minus u. So, degree of reaction basically reduces to half of 1 minus C a by u tan alpha 2 plus tan beta 3. So, this is one form of defining the degree of reaction that you can uh, relate degree of reaction. We have seen this definition even for compressors and we have also seen that degree of reaction is a function of a few parameters. One of them of course, it is the ratio of axial velocity to the blade speed C a by u. Besides that, there are the angles alpha 2 and beta 3 in this case. So, it is a function of the angles as well as um, the axial velocity and the blade speed. So, we can also simplify this in, in the sense that if you look at uh, 0 degree of reaction and uh, also look at a 50 percent degree of reaction turbine, we will see what are these special cases of um, axial turbines, where we can look at an impulse turbine and a 50 percent degree of reaction turbine. So, degree of reaction starting from the fundamentals, it is basically ratio of enthalpy drop, static enthalpy drop in the rotor divided by stagnation enthalpy drop in the stage, which we can simplify as we have seen and relate degree of reaction to um, the flow coefficient, which is C a by u and the angles. In this case, it is the absolute angle at the inlet of the rotor and uh, the relative angle or the blade angle at the exit of the rotor. So, that is tan alpha 2 plus tan beta 3. So, let us look at some special cases of the degree of reaction. Now, if you look at a symmetrical velocity triangle configuration, where alpha 2 is equal to minus beta 3, what we will see is that we get the degree of reaction as 0 0.5. So, this is known as a 50 percent degree of reaction turbine. We have seen this in the previous lecture as well. Another uh, special case is when V w 3 is equal to minus V w 2, then we get degree of reaction as 0, which is basically an impulse turbine. So, if we were to look at an impulse turbine a little more carefully and compare that with a uh, 50 percent stage, for a given stator outlet angle that is um, alpha 2, the impulse turbine stage requires a much higher axial velocity than the 50 percent reaction stage. In the impulse turbine, it is generally seen that all the flow velocities are higher and therefore, it is generally also seen that the efficiency of uh, an impulse turbine is usually lower than that of a 50 percent reaction stage for two turbines, which are generating the same power. That is of course, a general, general observation that because the velocity components are higher, uh, the losses are likely to be higher and therefore, efficiency is usually slightly lower than that of a 50 percent reaction turbine stage. So, let us look at these two special cases. This is the impulse turbine stage. We can see that the V w 3 or V w 2 will be equal to minus V w 3. If that is so, then degree of reaction becomes 0 and such a turbine is an impulse turbine stage. So, we have V w 3 and V w 2, which are opposing each other and equal in magnitude. That is when we have degree of reaction as 0. And what is the physical implication of this? In, in degree of reaction 0, it means that there is nothing much happening in the rotor as far as enthalpy drop is concerned. The rotor simply deflects the flow and there is no change in the enthalpy 
in the rotor and that is why degree of reaction is 0, because if there is no change in enthalpy in the rotor, the numerator is 0, degree of reaction is 0. Now, if you look at a 50 percent reaction turbine stage, then we have the angle, it is a symmetrical velocity triangle and therefore, alpha 2 will be equal to beta 3. So, if those angles are equal in magnitude, then you get velocity triangles which are symmetrical. You can see that this is uh, the velocity triangles are basically mirror images. What you have at the inlet is mirrored at the exit. So, that is why you have a symmetrical or a mirror image velocity triangle if uh, the reaction turbine is a 50 percent reaction stage. And what it means is that the um, enthalpy drop is shared equally between the rotor and the stator and that is what a 50 percent reaction uh, stage basically means. So, what we have defined in the last few minutes is um, this very important concept of degree of reaction, where uh, which basically tells us um, the amount of enthalpy drop which is shared between the rotor and the stator and how we can you know use that as a parameter to distinguish between these two types of uh, turbines. Impulse turbine, where you have degree of reaction as 0, which means that there is no enthalpy drop taking place in the rotor and we have seen that such a velocity triangle, we have the um, tangential component of relative velocity V w 3 is equal to minus V w 2. They are equal in magnitude, but they are opposite in direction and that is why in the velocity triangle you can see that they will oppose each other when you take up their components. 50 percent reaction stage, velocity triangles are symmetrical and you have alpha 2 is equal to minus beta 3. So, well, uh, these angles are same making the velocity triangles symmetrical or mirror images uh, across the rotor. Okay, so, now that we have uh, discussed about degree of reaction, let us move on to a very important aspect of performance of turbines that is the efficiency. I think I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture that efficiency in the case of turbine unlike in compressors, we have in turbines defined in different ways, basically depending upon the application for which the turbine is being used. Now, there are certain applications, let us say in a land based gas turbine power plant, where you are you're generating, you are using a gas turbine to generate power. So, here the application is such that you do not want the turbine exhaust to have any um, very high levels of kinetic energy, because that is getting wasted. So, you would like to use up as much kinetic energy as possible from the turbine it's itself without having to waste kinetic energy. So, here we would like to expand it to the minimum possible uh, enthalpy, the static enthalpy and therefore, um, any kinetic energy that is there at the exit is considered a waste. So, in such turbines we usually define efficiency in the form of what is known as total to static enthalpy. And uh, the other form of enthalpy that we are going to define is known as total to total enthalpy, which is what is of interest to aero engineers, because in a gas turbine engine, which is used in an aircraft for example, the there is enough kinetic energy uh, available at the turbine exhaust, which can be exa again expanded or further expanded through a nozzle to generate thrust. And you do not want the turbine exhaust to get or a turbine to exhaust itself uh, to the minimum possible kinetic energy, because you would also like to expand the flow further in a nozzle to generate thrust. So, in such applications you one would prefer to define efficiency uh, based on total to total or uh, stagnation enthalpies. So, these are the two um, commonly used forms of efficiencies. As I mentioned there are also other forms of efficiencies, which are not very commonly used like static to static and so on we will restrict our discussion to these two types of efficiencies, total to static and total to total efficiencies. Now, so um, uh, some general comments which I had made, let me just list them down here. So, the aerodynamic losses in a turbine as we have seen uh, differ with stage configuration or the degree of reaction and uh, so improved efficiency is associated with a higher amount or level of reaction, which implies less work per stage and therefore, higher number of stages for a given overall pressure ratio. So, the reason why we need to understand um, 
efficiency or the sources of losses is that it firstly helps us in making a choice between different configurations either the uh, impulse or a reaction. But the other uh, advantage is that it will also tell us how one can control these different forms of losses. So, based on our understanding um, we can define two types of efficiencies total to static efficiency and the total to total efficiency and which efficiency definition to use will basically be determined by the application for which the turbine is being used. So, um, in let us say the land based power plant as I mentioned the turbine output is uh, basically in the form of shaft power that is the turbine is connected to um, a generator which generates work out or electricity and therefore, exhaust kinetic energy is, a, is, is basically considered as a loss. Therefore, in such a case the ideal turbine process would be isentropic such that there is no exhaust kinetic energy that is the exhaust itself is static and there is no kinetic energy associ associated with that exhaust and that is where we would define what is known as total to static efficiency. In aero engines the turbine exhaust is required to have certain amount of energy which will further be expanded in a nozzle to generate thrust. So, there you would not want to expand the turbine to such a level that it is static at the exit and then with very little kinetic energy, but you would like there to be some more kinetic energy left which can be expanded further in a in a nozzle. So, there we would normally define the total to total efficiency in such applications. So, let us take a look at um, a general turbine process or expansion through a turbine and then we will come up with the efficiency definitions. So, this is a an expansion process in a turbine stage well, where station 1 is the nozzle entry, 2 is nozzle exit and 3 is the uh, rotor exit. So, 2 is also the uh, rotor inlet. So, the flow initially has a pressure at the inlet stagnation pressure at P 0 1 and uh, static pressure at the entry is P 1. So, P 0 1 plus uh, P 1 plus um, the dynamic head gives us P 0 1. So, we have plotted this on a temperature entropy scale. Now, if this entire process were to be isentropic then the expansion takes place along these dotted lines. So, P 0 1 all the way up to the exit um, which is 3 s if it were if you are considering a static condition at the exit. And uh, so, the actual turbine process of course, is defined by this um, solid line the bolt line here between static pressure P 1 static pressure P 2 at the nozzle exit or rotor entry and P 3 at the rotor exit the corresponding stagnation pressure at the rotor exit is P 0 3, which is basically um, what you have the temperature at station 3 plus the dynamic head C 3 square by 2 C p will give us the stagnation temperature there. Now, the corresponding conditions in the isentropic case would be T 0 3 subscript S or at the rotor exit which is the stagnation. And uh, so, when we are defining efficiency in two different ways that we are going to discuss about, let us first take up the total to static efficiency. Now, in this case we are talking about an ideal turbine work with no exhaust kinetic energy, which means that we have expanded all the way up to the station which is given by this particular state. So, from 0 1 all the way up to the station and which means there is no more kinetic energy at the exit of the turbine. So, we have the ideal turbine work in this case would be C p times T 0 1 minus T 3 s. So, the total to static efficiency in this case is defined as the uh, it is denoted by symbol eta T s which is total to static T 0 1 minus T 0 3 divided by T 0 1 minus T 3 s that is T 0 1 minus the temperature corresponding to this T 0 3 divided by T 0 1 minus T 3 s. So, that is the total to static efficiency. 
the denominator we are going to simplify because uh, this is an isentropic temperature here. So, this can be expressed in terms of the corresponding pressure ratios and so we have T 0 1 minus T 0 3 at the numerator divided by T 0 1 into 1 minus P 3 by P 0 1 raised to gamma minus 1 by gamma. This follows from the isentropic relation. So, this is basically 1 minus T 0 1 by T 0 3 divided by 1 minus P 3 by P 0 1 raised to gamma minus 1 by gamma. So, this is the basic definition of total to static efficiency. Now, if you look at uh, applications, uh, a typical application being turbojet engines where the exhaust kinetic energy is not really a loss, it can be converted to thrust using a nozzle. So, in such cases the ideal turbine work is not uh, equal to the static conditions at the exit, but the stagnation conditions. So, the ideal work in such cases would be C p times T 0 1 minus T 0 3 s and therefore, we define total to total efficiency which is um, eta t t that is T 0 1 minus T 0 3 divided by T 0 1 minus T 0 3 s and again the denominator we will express in terms of pressure ratios because that is isentropic. We have 1 minus T 0 3 by T 0 1 divided by 1 minus P 0 3 by P 0 1 raised to gamma minus 1 by gamma. So, we have defined uh, two forms of efficiencies, the total to static efficiency and the total to total efficiency. We can also now relate these two types of efficiencies and see how these efficiencies can be compared for the same type of uh, or for the same configuration. If you were to compare these two different forms of efficiency, course, with certain assumptions we can still compare total to static efficiency and total to total efficiency and um, we will also see how using these efficiencies we can calculate work done by a given turbine. So, if we make if you were to make an uh, approximation that T 0 3 s minus T 3 s is approximately equal to T 0 3 s minus T 3 is equal to C 3 square by 2 C p which is let me go back to the uh, diagram here. So, what we are saying is the difference between T 0 3 s minus T 3 s and this and the T 3 s is C 3 square by 2 C p. So, which means that if effectively T 0 3 s and T 3 they are not much different as you can see from this T s diagram itself. So, it is very much a valid assumption that we can make. And uh, so, if th this were to be the case, if you make this assumption, then we can relate total to total efficiency as uh, equal to eta T s divided by 1 minus C 3 square multiplied by 2 C p T 0 1 minus T 3 s. So, what you can see here is that if this assumption were to be true and you calculate the total to total efficiency and total to static efficiency for a turbine, we could see that the total to total efficiency is likely to be greater than the total to static efficiency, which is also obvious from the um, T s diagram that I had shown. If you look at the expansion process for the same turbine, if you calculate both these efficiencies, the total to total efficiency is likely to be higher than the total to static efficiency. Now, so using these definitions, one can also calculate uh, or make use of these definitions to calculate the corresponding work done by uh, the turbine depending upon the application itself. So, if you were to use the total to total efficiency, then we have the work done uh, or specific work done uh, as um, in the case where let us say in an application of a gas turbine engine used in an aero um, aircraft engine like in a turbojet then the work done by the turbine is related to the efficiency which is total to total efficiency multiplied by C p into T 0 1 into 1 minus P 0 3 by P 0 1 raised to gamma minus 1 by gamma. And similarly, um, the work specific work uh, related to the total to static efficiency as um, eta T s into C p T 0 1 1 minus P 3 divided by P 0 1 raised to gamma minus 1 by gamma. So, uh, using the efficiency definitions and uh, the specific application for which these efficiencies have been defined for, we can use these efficiencies to calculate the corresponding work done uh, by the turbine in, uh, under these uh, different applications.
So, let me give you one example to just indicate the effect of reaction. I think I mentioned when we're, I was talking about impulse and reaction turbines that both these turbines in the last class as well I mentioned that the, there is a difference in the specific work done and loading that both of these uh, different types of turbines can handle and also the fact that there is a certain difference in the efficiencies that one would get by using these two different configurations of turbines. So, let us take a look at the influence of loading on the efficiency. We will in this case calculate total to static efficiency. So, you have um, reaction on the x axis, the efficiency total to static efficiency on the y axis and three different values of loading. So, one can see that as you increase the loading and uh, keep changing the reaction, uh, what happens to the efficiency. So, let us take a look at one of these cases, uh, let us say loading factor is equal to 1. So, as you change the reaction on the extreme right, we have an impulse uh, turbine which has a reaction of 0. So, as we start from an extreme which is an impulse turbine and we move towards um, let us say a 50 percent reaction case, you can see that there is a steady increase in the efficiency and after that of course, there is a drop in the efficiency, but this is for um, loading factor is equal to 1. Now, if you look at a loading factor greater than 1, let us say loading factor of 2 or 3, then the trends are slightly different. In fact, you get a, the, the highest efficiency when the, the reaction is equal to 0 that is for an impulse turbine uh, stage that is with higher amounts of loading your impulse turbine stage has a better efficiency than any other um, case of reaction because the moment you have any amount of reaction it is no longer an impulse it, it, it bec basically becomes a reaction turbine and that is also true for higher values of loading um, between 2 and 3 and so on. Uh, and so, uh, this is just to give some idea about what happens uh, as we change the amount of loading with increased levels of loading, um, how does reaction influence the efficiency. This is also linked to a comment I had ma made earlier, I would want you to think about why is it that as you increase the loading, an impulse turbine seems to at least uh, perform better in terms of efficiency and uh, what is the effect of increasing loading uh, on let us say the efficiency of the turbine as you keep changing the level of reaction from impulse which has 0 reaction uh, let us say to 50 percent reaction where the reaction is or the enthalpy drop is equally shared by the nozzle and the rotor. So, just give it a thought on why there should be a, a drop in efficiency as you move from impulse towards uh, higher levels of reaction. Okay, so, uh, let us move on to uh, the next topic uh, we have for discussion in today's class that is to do with losses in a turbine. I mentioned in the beginning that I will restrict the discussion uh, to just the basics of losses because I have already had a, a detailed discussion on losses when we were talking about compressors. And so, most of the concepts we had discussed there is applicable for the turbine as well. Of course, the magnitude of losses will be quite different for compressors and turbines, but uh, the uh, concept is still the same. So, I will not repeat uh, the estimation of losses that we had discussed in detail with reference to a compressor, because it is also applicable for a turbine. Now, uh, when I had discussed about compressors and losses in a compressor, I had mentioned that there are distinct forms of losses. There are basically, we could classify losses as four sets of losses. One is on account of viscous effects or known as the viscous losses. Then there are three dimensional effects like tip leakage flows and secondary flows. One may have shock losses and also mixing losses. And uh, so, if you were to um, isolate these losses, if because if you have to uh, estimate losses in a turbine and one would like to target, let us say, different forms of these losses and see if we can. Um, minimize these losses, one would need to know let us say what is the contribution of viscous loss, what is the contribution of 3D losses like secondary flows or tip leakage flows and so on. But it is not very easy to um, 
segregate these different losses. There are empirical correlations for estimating all these different forms of losses. We, we had discussed some of them in, in the context of compressors, one could extend the same for turbines as well. Total losses in a turbine obviously is a sum total of all these different forms of losses, um, whether it is viscous loss or the 3D losses which include secondary flows and tip leakage flows, shock losses and uh, the mixing losses. So, let us look at these losses in little more detail, but not too much as I had mentioned, um, just some uh, preliminary discussion on these losses. If you look at viscous losses, there are again different components of viscous losses. Uh, there is one on account of the profile or the nature of the airfoil cross section and that is known as the profile loss. Annulus loss would refer to growth of boundary layer along the axis and end wall losses on account of boundary layer effects in the corner or junction between the blade surface and the casing or hub. Now, in 3D effects, we have secondary flows, uh, which is on account of flow through curved blade passages, tip leakage flows, which is basically the flow uh, leaking from the pressure surface to the suction surface. And uh, what is generally observed is that if you look at the uh, 3D effects, the losses are likely to be higher for a turbine, may, primarily because of the fact that the flow turning is much higher in a turbine uh, as compared to a compressor. Secondary flows, for example, is directly related to the amount of flow turning. And if you compare a compressor with that of a turbine, the flow turning in a typical turbine uh, blade is much higher than that of a compressor secondary flows are likely to be uh, much higher in, in the case of turbine. This is also true for the tip leakage flows, basically because tip leakage is on account of the difference between the pressure surface and the suction surface and uh, blade loading is usually much higher in a turbine than in a compressor and therefore, um, leakage flows are also likely to be higher in, the, in a turbine. And what complicates the matter uh, in a turbine is the fact that you also have a higher temperature and it is no longer just pure air, you also have a combustion product coming in from the combustion chamber, which might complicate uh, the flow um, behavior in, in the case of a turbine. Now, let me just give you one example of uh, profile loss. I will, as I mentioned, I will not go into details of estimating all these losses. We have done that for the compressor and you could easily extend that to the turbine as well. Now, if you look at let us say the profile loss and uh, look at what happens as you keep changing the incidence. Now, I have these uh, profile loss distribution for two distinct cases, the impulse turbine and the reaction turbine. The solid line refers to the impulse turbine and the dotted line is for the reaction turbine. So, one can see that there is a significant difference between what happens in an impulse turbine and reaction turbine. The losses as you can see are much higher for an impulse turbine case and that varies significantly with uh, the incidence. So, the sensitivity of impulse blades to incidence is much higher, especially at positive incidence you can see that after around 8 or 9 degrees the losses increase substantially. There is a very sharp increase in losses at positive incidence around 8 or 9 degrees. Of course, this is for a very typical case of a, a, a turbine blade. On the other hand, if you look at an, a reaction blade, it is probably a little uh, better adjusted to um, high changes in incidence. Of course, with very high incidence exceeding 20 degrees, there is of course, a very uh, substantial uh, steep increase in the losses even in a reaction stage. But if you look at the performance of a typical reaction blade, it is not very sensitive to incidence between let us say plus minus 10 degrees, whereas an impulse blade is quite sensitive to incidence and uh, especially uh, at positive incidence angles. We also have alpha 2 plotted for both these cases. So, what we can see is that um, alpha 2 remains more or less well behaved, whether it is impulse or reaction turbine, even though the incidence is different. The basic reason for this uh, being true is the fact that 
in both impulse as well as reaction blades, the flow is encountering an accelerating flow, I mean a favorable pressure gradient. So, even if there is a higher level of incidence of the flow entering the um, nozzle, because it is an accelerating flow, the flow is generally well behaved, which is unlike in a compressor, where the flow encounters um, an adverse pressure gradient. And so, the outflow would be extremely sensitive to the in, in incidence angle as well. That is, if the incidence varies between a, beyond a certain range, the outflow angle also correspondingly changes drastically because of the fact that it, the flow is encountering an adverse pressure gradient. And so, the chances of flow separation is substantially higher in, uh, in the case of a compressor, uh, which is not true for a turbine, where the flow is almost always encountering a favorable pressure gradient. And therefore, uh, that in partly explains why the gas outflow angle alpha 2 really does not change much uh, and the, the insensitivity of outflow angle is larger, much larger for a turbine as compared to that of a compressor. Now, uh, if you, if you now we come back to the, um, the types of losses in a turbine. If you recall, when we discussed about losses in a compressor, we had um, classified them into two distinct sets of losses. One is to do with 2 D losses and one is to do with uh, the 3 D effects like secondary flows and, and so on. Now, if you look at just the two dimensional losses, um, for which there are a lot of empirical correlations available. Uh, 2 D losses basically are relevant uh, to axial flow turbo machines. And, um, we have seen that in a compressor as well that uh, uh, when we were discussing about axial compressors that if you look if you look at 2 d losses they are mainly associated with the ba blade boundary layers um, shock boundary layer interaction separated flows and wakes some of these of course are not really uh, that significant for a turbine for example the separation or blade boundary layers which are fairly well behaved in the case of turbines and separation on the other hand in, in certain operating conditions, one might have a lead, leading edge separation bubble uh, in the rotor, but that is um, the, the chances of such occurrences are very, very rare. Um, unlike in the case of compressors, where boundary layer behavior is always a concern because of adverse pressure gradients. So, mixing of uh, these wakes that come from the uh, rotor blade with the uh, nozzle downstream of the nod, uh, second next stage obviously creates a certain amount of losses and that is of course something that can be estimated by mixing um, loss models which are available from which one can estimate uh, to a certain amount of accuracy uh, what is the effect of these wakes shed from the rotor on subsequent stages. So, if you look at 2 D losses in particular uh, we can classify two dimensional losses into different forms. We have profile loss due to the boundary layer and its effect and uh, whether you have laminar or boundary layer separation, which is of course, um, rather rare in the case of turbines. One may have wake mixing losses because of the wake from the rotor interacting with the subsequent stages. One may also have shock losses, which I will also discuss in little more detail in a later slide and of course, the trailing edge loss due to the blade, because trailing edge um, is usually rounded as we have seen in compressors. One may have to provide a certain rounding at the trailing edge and there is certain amount of loss associated with that rounding as well. So, the total loss in a turbine like in the case of compressor is obviously a sum total of all these different components. So, without going into details of how to estimate these losses, um, we can just summarize that the overall losses in a turbine is a sum total of all these different forms of um, losses. One may have profile loss uh, on account of the nature of the blade surface itself, one may have shock losses and um, secondary flow losses which can be quite significant in turbines, triplicate loss and of course, end wall losses. So, if you make a comparison of this with a compressor, let us say a transonic compressor where also you may have shock losses. Um, the major distinguishing factor between a turbine and a compressor in terms of losses would be the 3D effects. Uh, 
which are likely to be much more significant in a turbine like secondary flows and tip leakage flows as compared to a compressor um, where of course, these losses are still present, but if you were to make a one to one comparison the losses in, in the case of a turbine when it comes to secondary flows and tip leakage flows are likely to be higher. But of course, there are methods of controlling some of these in a turbine because um, many of the turbine blades also have cooling mechanisms uh, which again we will discuss in detail in later lectures. So, some of these cooling holes are also sometimes used to um, minimize let us say the tip leakage flows or secondary flows in some way or the other. We will discuss that in, in some of our later lectures. Now, there is another aspect I wanted to have some discussion on that is uh, to do with deviation and I um, will probably spend a couple of slides on this aspect as well. Now, this is also true with in the case of compressors and um, that it is an it is a known fact that the flow exiting the rotor does not really leave the blade uh, at the angle for which it has been designed for. But it of course, in the case of turbines it is easier to estimate the outflow angle uh, because the flow is encountering um, an accelerating flow passage and uh, if the flow is not basically choked or if there are no shocks present at the exit of the rotor then it is uh, at the exit of the nozzle it is relatively easier to estimate the amount of uh, the outflow gas outflow angle from the nozzle. But of course, if there are shocks present that something which I will show you a little later then the outflow angle can be quite different from, from, from what it has been basically designed for. So, what is basically found from experience is that the actual exit angle at the design pressure ratio can be fairly well estimated by um, cos inverse of d by s as long as the nozzle is not choked. So, let me just explain uh, what I mean by cos inverse of d by s. So, if you look at a typical nozzle exit flow when I had shown a picture of the cascade I had mentioned that this is basically the throat of the nozzle and uh, and the flow exits the nozzle at an angle of alpha 2. So, if you look at the uh, pitch at the trailing edge which we have denoted by s and this is the throat and which is denoted by d, then one can estimate uh, the uh, outflow angle the gas outflow angle alpha 2 as what is shown here that is cos inverse of d by s. That is if you take an inverse of uh, of course, this is still an approximation, but it is found that it is fairly well the approximation fairly well captures the ag angle at which the flow exits the nozzle. Now, this is true as long as uh, the, the nozzle is not choked, because once it choked once the nozzle is operating under choked condition then there is a possibility that the outflow um, is supersonic which means that there is a possibility of the presence of shocks uh, at the exit or the trailing edge of the nozzle. The presence of shocks can deflect the flow and cause a certain amount of deviation. And uh, in such cases of course, you one cannot really um, estimate the angle um, exiting the uh, nozzle uh, as just cos inverse d by s. So, if you look at a case where there is um, the flow is not choked, it is unchoked, then there is obviously there is no, uh, so the flow is not supersonic at the exit of the nozzle and which means that um, the flow angle can be basically well estimated by just taking the inverse of uh, d by s. Now, if you look at the other case where there is a possibility of shock, in which case it is basically a choked flow after the throat because it is, um, if you let me take you back here after the throat we might have an expansion here um, which might cause the flow to become supersonic if the uh, back pressure is uh, low enough then you may have it basically acts like a converging diverging nozzle and one may have shocks um, emanating from downstream of the throat if there is a trailing edge shock exiting um, at the flow exiting the um, nozzle then the presence of these shocks obviously can deflect the flow to 
a different angle. So as you can see here the flow is not really exiting at an angle that it was designed for. The presence of these shocks, there is a trailing edge shock or a reattachment shock and so on. The presence of these series of shocks can cause the flow to get deflected or deviated at an angle which is quite different from what it has been designed for. So, in such cases as what you see here, the um, angle alpha 2 is not well established or um, estimated by uh, simply taking a d by cos inverse of d by s. Of course, there are also uh, empirical correlations in this case to estimate the flow angle, because if you know the uh, shock structure um, of the flow leaving the nozzle um, from the analysis of the flow through these different shocks, one can sort of estimate um, what is the angle at which the flow is leaving the nozzle but that requires a much more complicated analysis than simply taking um, considering just the geometric parameters and estimating uh, the exit flow angle to be a function of these geometric parameters. So, in the presence of a supersonic flow where there are shocks present, the, the flow structure is obviously more complicated and the flow undergoes deviation which is more quite different from what one can otherwise esti easily estimate. Okay, so, I just brought up this aspect of deviation um, because of the fact that in uh, nozzle flow, there is a possibility that the flow exiting the nozzle can be supersonic and therefore, the flow might undergo a deviation which is quite different from what it has been primarily designed for, which means that this flow entering into the rotor basically has a different angle than what it has been designed for and therefore, uh, one needs to take this aspect into account when uh, estimating the flow through the entire stage. Okay, so, let me now quickly recap our discussion in today's class. We had um, discussion on three distinct topics. We started off with uh, degree of reaction and I spent some time discussing about degree of reaction, its significance and how one can estimate degree of reaction and based on est this estimation, how one can determine the configuration of the turbine, whether it is impulse or reaction and so on. We then spent some time discussing about losses, the different types of losses, the 2D losses and the 3D losses and I mentioned that um, there are certain uh, aspects of losses which um, or the contribution of these different sources of losses is different in the case of turbine and a compressor because of the very nature of flow passing through a turbine or a compressor. We also discussed about the efficiencies and the different uh, definitions of efficiency, the total to static efficiency and total to total efficiency, which is what we discussed in detail today. And uh, of course, uh, towards the end, I also discussed about uh, the aspect of deviation, which is um, of significance, especially when the flow is unchoked and uh, well, especially when the flow is choked and the flow exiting the nozzle is supersonic. We will continue our discussion on axial flow turbines in the next lecture. We will basically be talking about the performance characteristics of an axial flow turbine and how one can match the exit flow from a turbine with a downstream component like a nozzle. So, these are two uh, aspects that we will be discussing in the next lecture, which would be lecture number 22.